kind of personality you have. I'm going to also do a course totally on personalities. You know, they say your personality is not your view about yourself, rather your personality is people's view of who you are. And when we look at personalities, we will make a discovery that different temperaments make up your personality. So we're going to have a course on that, if not this week, maybe sometime next week, we're going to look at that personality, it's very, very critical, because when we look at the subject of compatibility, because one of the principles of who you choose as your life partner is compatibility, one of the indices of, we're going to look at under compatibility is this personality trait. It's very, very key. Like, remember, this topic of what we're looking at is the biblical principles of choosing a life partner. Now, one of the principles the world uses to choose a life partner is horoscope. So if you watch some of these um, reality dating shows, you know, one of the first things the couple or the man or the woman or whoever ask themselves, they want to find out is, hey, what star are you? What sign are you? They say, I'm um, Capricorn, I'm Cancer, I'm Libra. They're like, oh, we're not compatible. Oh, we are compatible. Oh, we float together. You know, they're using astrology to check if they're compatible. That is also not biblical. We don't believe in that. Why? The elements can be manipulated by fallen angels because they live in the heavens, they live in space. So the constellations, the stars and all that can be manipulated by these beings. So you cannot use it as an indicator to check if you are compatible with someone or not. So we don't believe in that. The you you know that others know is they reveal to you. Sorry. The you you know that others the you you don't know but others know is on reveal to you. Then the you you don't know that others don't even know is the hidden you. Only God knows that. So uh, for every human being, you need to embark on the quest to know who you are. Listen to people when they tell you some things about you. Don't say, ah, I don't do that. Oh, I don't act like that. Oh, I don't say that. The truth is that you say that, but you don't, you've not yet realized that you do. Then there is one that you don't even know and nobody else knows except God. You should also embark on a quest to know you, you know, the hidden you. It's very, very important. Then, when we also talk about knowledge, we talk about know the opposite sex. Very key, very, very key. You know, this is one of the things that have caused a lot of friction in marriage. Because um, both parties enter the marriage, of course, it's so much expectation. You know, I'm working, in a, I'm working on a course on that. Because one of the courses that I need to teach people before they get married. And, you know, we enter marriage with the high expectation to get into marriage. And our expectations are dashed. It causes a lot of trouble, a lot of, a lot of brides get into marriage and they are shocked. I mean, what they get, they never expected. So you need to know the opposite sex. Generally, then when you start cutting, you need to know your man specifically. Very important because you're going to live under the same room for the rest of your life. So you need to embark on that quest. Then I also talked about past experiences. You need to also Take a cue from your past experiences. Don't be beaten. Don't be beaten twice. They say, "Once beaten, twice shy." So, if your past experiences, your past relationships that had failed, you need to draw lessons from it as you move forward into your next relationship. So, you make the same old mistake twice. So, it's very important to get knowledge from that too. Very, very key. Then, the next thing also you need to look at is taking a cue from good marriages taking a cue from good marriages you have friends godly friends christian born again couples that are, that are married and you know that their marriage is working because a whole lot of people can pretend you know that their marriage is working take a cue from them observe them if possible get even close to to them so you can learn one or two things you can even turn one of them into your mentor. So you can uh, learn one of two things about the step you're about to take. So it's very, very critical. So now the third principle I also mentioned yesterday was purpose. You cannot underemphasize purpose. Purpose is very, very important too. What I mean by purpose is knowing the reason why God sent you here on earth. Knowing why God sent you here on earth. Very, very important. Your purpose in life, when you discover it, will definitely help you to choose who to marry. 
because one of the compatibilities we need a knowledge check is the compatibility of vision, the compatibility of purpose. Not that you might have 100% similar purpose to your person you want to get married to, but let your purposes be in and around the same neighborhood, if you understand what I mean. Very, very important. Very, very important. You know, one of the quests every human being to embark in life is purpose discovery. You know, Pastor Chukudi really teaches on essence of life. That is one subject that has transformed my life. Where he talked about the three kinds of life. He talked about the wasted life. There's a man that doesn't have a clue that anything like purpose exists. is non-existent. So they go waste their life like the robbers, you know, those the, the miscreants in society. Then we have those that they're not wasting their life, but they are spending it. Those are people that are just living without a real purpose in life. They're just trying to get by, you know. Then there's a third category. These are people that don't spend their life. They don't just wake up and let the days roll by. These are the ones that are purposeful. They wake up with a jump. Because you know there is a lot of stuff they need to achieve that day. They wake up with a start. These are guys that live invested lives. They live invested lives. You know, I've met a lot of ladies. They come to me like, Pastor, five guys are on the line. I don't know who to choose. Pastor, three guys on the line. I don't know who to choose. Pastor, seven guys on the line. I don't know who to choose. And I laugh. I was like, it's very easy. It's choosing who to marry is one of the easiest things ever. But it becomes difficult and challenging when you don't know who you are. Because if you know who you are, you just look around the five, the six, the three, the two guys in your life and identify who has the similar vision as you have. Very simple. Very simple. That settles everything. That solves all the problems. You know. So it's very critical. You need to know where you're going to in life. You need you need to you need to you need to know where you'll be in the next five years. Now one guy went on a date with a lady in church and as we were talking the guy said to her, um where do you see yourself in the next five years? And the lady was like, next next five years married. Have kids. And the guy was like, uh-huh, what up? I don't know, I'll take care of my kids. I was like, okay, five years might be too short for you to see, you know, beyond. So, okay, what of 10 years? Ah, my kids will be growing now, I'll be taking care of them. And the guy was like, whoops, he was so flustered that he didn't know what to say, you know. That's a, that's a lady that does not know where she's going to. The Bible says, iron sharpeneth iron. Do you know what that means? The two of you should sharpen and shape each other. Now, imagine if you marry a kind of lady that does not have any goal in life. And the guy is chasing his goal and at a point he feels um, the challenges are so much and he needs somebody to prep him up. Perhaps I say two is better than one. You know, if one fall, the other one will bring them up. If, if they like together, they'll have it. Meaning, when you get married, you're getting married to your partner, somebody that's also assist and prop you up whenever you're down. On the purpose, Amos 3 verse 3 is very important. The Bible says, can two work together except they be agreed? I know a couple that got married. She, he, he was a doctor, got married to a lawyer. And I don't know exactly the details, but the woman just did not um, go further after her. I think it's called LLB. Is it LLB now? You want to get from law school? I think it's LLB. And she just didn't go for that. She just sat at home, took care of her kids because it wasn't really her intention because she really wanted to go for that and do all that. But somehow, somehow, somehow it didn't work. So she sat at home, years rolled by from one year to two years, from three, two years, ten, five years, ten years. And just getting to 20 years, of course, her kids are all in university, living home and all that. At their 25th wedding anniversary, she looked back and she discovered something. She discovered that all her classmates and friends, they are all judges. One judge of the appeal court, the other judge of high court, the other guy, the, the guys, I didn't, the ladies I didn't get into the bench that was, it doesn't remain in the bar. They are all doing pretty well in all their chambers and all their top lawyers known all over the country. They were really excelling in what in what they you know what they have chosen to do. And she felt regret. And she felt regret. She felt so bad. 
she just discovered that she could not just come come out and stand with her friends anymore because when they talk they're talking about things i mean she just what she be talking about uh, my child oh, just in university oh. uh, my children no oh. they don't they, they cannot long, they cannot longer discuss at you know a serious uh, intellectual level because of how she spent years she let years roll by without chasing her dream without chasing her purpose in life you know that is why i constantly push everyone around me and push my wife to chase what she needs to chase in life but what really happens is that they wake up when time has so passed and they will feel that it's their husband that probably cost them not to chase their dreams so purpose is important you need to know why you're here on earth how am i going to pursue it what do i want to accomplish in life very very important work on yourself so what do i mean what do i mean by work work on yourself work on your work on making yourself the sort of person that ev- that a godly christian would like to marry you know what really happens is that we have we spend so much time looking for Mr. Right, Miss Right, and we forget to ask ourselves, are we actually Miss Right? Will a Mr. Right meet me and be like, oh, this is my missing ring? Or oh, the guys, are you actually working on yourself that when she or you meet her, she'll be like, oh, this is my dream man? So we usually forget the aspect of, of, of working on ourselves. And we're busy looking for who has worked on himself or who has worked on herself to find us appealing. It doesn't work that way. The Bible says to go forward, he shows himself forward. You know, in our Nigerian lingua, we say to the 419, God will do 419 to you. To the forward, he will show himself forward. So, work on yourself. Be the best mate you can ever be, be the best partner. That you can never be. Be the best spouse you can ever be. Work on yourself. Prepare for that day. There's a popular saying that says that preparation, when it meets with opportunity, there will be a breakthrough. So a lot of ladies meet their dream man, and their dream man does not take any interest in them because this lady. She has not yet worked on herself to the extent that this man wants or is looking for. And it's vice versa, it's not just on the woman. You know, a man meets his dream wife, but the wife is not really interested in him because he has not worked on himself. Guys, please get a lady friend that you don't have interest in, a normal friend, and talk to her. Let her help you, especially with your wardrobe. Some guys dress like, I don't know. When you see them, you just... Guys, I'll kill your diet. When you see them, you're like, oh my God, did he wear that? Did he wear a white trouser? Did he wear a rainbow color shirt? Oh no. Is he wearing a brown, light brown belt? You know, with a black shoe? Oh no, he didn't. You know? work on yourself not just about the physical appearance but hey the physical appearance matters why man looks at the physical appearance why god looks at the heart don't say ah but i'm okay i'm a good man on the inside ah, i'm a good man on the inside. you should just try me now you will know that i'm good i'm mine i'm a wife material hey before they get the point of knowing you on the inside they are moved by what is actually we men because men are moved by men are moved by what is it imagine if adam woke up woke up from <laughs> Imagine that woke up from that sleep <laughs> and say woman beside him. That was a full original war. What did it happen to mankind? So even God knows that packaging is important. God, as spiritual as he is, packaged it that Adam spoke in tongues without the baptism of the Holy Ghost. So package yourself. Sometimes it's not important. It's very important. Make up. We don't need masquerades around. We know where to find them in the village. Make up. Don't scare brothers in church on Sunday. 
Make up. Then beyond all that, work on your manner, work on your attitude. A lot of ladies are unmarried today because of their attitude. All day in church, we are preparing for service and uh, I registered, I think that was on a Saturday before church service. And you see this usher walking. Me, me, me. <laughs> What's going on here? <laughs> Leave it, I'll carry it. You can't carry it. start, I think, like five, six, seven. She don't worry, I'll carry it. She'll carry it. Ah, and I looked, I saw her about to carry five, six, start. They were like, hey, don't do that. Flex was, I can do it, I can carry it, no problem. I said, there's a problem. There are guys around. Ask those that know me, I don't let ladies lift heavy weights around me. You don't try it. Even if you can, maybe you have a gym in your house, no problem. When you're outside, play the lady. Even one chair. Say, ah, bro, please, can you help me move this chair, please? Just arrange it, please. Guys are looking for such things. They don't want... <laughs> they don't want... Somebody wrote color riot. They don't want... <laughs> They don't want another man in his house. Adam does not want to marry Steve. Adam is looking for an Eve to marry. So every woman be feminine. Feminine. Even though you can do it when you're outside, be feminine. Let your femininity come through. You know, I don't know if I'll have time while teaching this. We talk about femininity. Talk about femininity. A woman that makes herself so desirous that every man is falling over themselves for her the fascinating woman the fascinating woman is the woman that have combined virtues you know have all those godly virtues and also combined it with charm she's so charming she's so feminine don't say you have all the virtues in proverbs 31 we feel those are good beautiful but you need charm it is charm that makes you attractive that makes you appealing to the man never forget that men are ruled by their eyes. But there's a balance, there's a healthy balance in all of this. Don't also go to the other extreme. And you have charm without virtues. What happens if you have charm without virtues is that your charm will attract the man. He will come. He will hang around. But when he discovers that this is all glitter, glamour, that there, you don't have steel on your inside, there, there are no virtues, he will take off, he will walk up us. So there must be the balance. You must have both. I must have both. Very important. I cannot overemphasize working on yourself. You just have to work on yourself. Not just physically. Make a success of your career. Tell you guys. Make a success of your career. They say that the beauty of a man is his bank account. My brother, it is true. Mm-hmm. I'm very spiritual. But I'm also very realistic. Because we live on planet Earth. When we move to heaven, then we can forget being realistic. We'll be all spiritual. But whilst we are here, you just have to have both. Work on your back account. There's a kind of back account you have. You can get any woman. So not just your physical back account in First Bank, Barclays, or any of those other banks. Also work on your spiritual back account. Very important for the guys. Because, you know, Pastor will say that if you don't have enough money then no problem go and get spiritual assets when you have spiritual power money will find you so it's both ways the spiritual asset is the holy ghost that you have worked on that you have you have maximized rather develop spiritual power with spiritual power comes physical moolah you know you know make, making it rain you can make it rain now make the holy ghost rain when the holy ghost rains this one will not happen automatically. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Happens automatically. Happens automatically. So working on yourself is critical. This is the fourth principle I'm giving you guys. Very, very, very critical. Alright, I'm going to talk about the next principle, which is the principle of maturity. Principle of maturity. For you to get married, to be even mature. Though maturity really is not by age. Because I've seen a 40-year-old man still acting like a baby. So it's not really about age, but it's all about your emotion. Because if you're not emotionally mature, it's difficult to take care of a woman or handle a woman rather, because women are a bundle of emotions. Yes, they are. And that's what makes them a woman. It's the beautiful thing about them. It's not bad. 
though when we talk about age, we don't also believe that somebody that is not yet a legal adult should marry. So I expect that both of you must have gotten to the legal age of marriage. Legal age to marry. Then you can take it from there. So it's not, like I said, it's not about number or age, but it's all about your emotions. For the guys, you have to be matured emotionally, you have to be matured financially, and especially matured, you must have at least cut the umbilical cord between you and your mom or your father. That's what the Bible says in the place in Genesis chapter 2, that for this reason a man shall leave father, mother, and shall cleave to his wife. To cleave to his wife. So don't be the kind of man that's, that still takes instruction from home. No, don't do that. Or before you can do anything, you take permission from your father-in-law. That shouldn't happen. It shouldn't happen. So the man that is a man, not by developing physically or passing through property, the man that is a man is a man that rules himself. That doesn't mean you don't take advice from your parents. That's not what I'm saying. You take advice from your parents. But they don't dictate to you what happens in your home. In that home, the man is the head of the home. Very important. Definitely don't even consider a man that still lives with his parents. That's not even paid one house rent. How will he then fend for you? He should move out of his home even before my needs to move out of his father's house and go and at least pay rent have his own home. I'm not saying he should have everything in the house, but at least has paid rent. He can have one bed, one mattress, one couch, one sofa, and all that. That's, that's a man that's starting like doesn't matter, but at least he has a roof over his head that he paid for. That is financial maturity. Very, very, very key. Very, very key. So the next one I'm going to talk about is make a list. Make a list. What do I mean by making a list? This is a bit um, out of practice, so to say, somewhat. But it is important. The Bible says in Habakkuk that you should that he stand on the watch to see what God says to him and what he will do when he's being reproved. He said first to write down the vision. Make it plain. That anyone that reads it can run with it. It's very important make a list of the characteristics, attributes, character of the kind of person you want to marry. Very important. I really tell this to women because based on, you know, the way our society is, it is such that the man is supposed to be the hunter, chasing after the woman. So it's a bit difficult for a woman to go searching for a man you know it totally goes against what they stand for that does not mean that a woman cannot position herself you know when we look at the ruth and the boaz story you see what ruth's mother-in-law told her naomi he advised her to position herself to be seen don't misinterpret that as chasing ruth didn't chase boaz but she put herself out there. Let me use them to improve that. That which put herself out there to be seen. Because if you are not seen, nobody will find you. There are a lot of products on sale in every country, but you don't get to know about them because they've not invested in advert. That is why the advert industry is a multi-billion-pound-dollar industry. And Google is making a whole lot of money from it now. Facebook is cracking it. They're making a whole lot of money from adverts. Have you ever wondered how you check up something on a site? If you want to buy something, you check it up maybe on Amazon or eBay or one of those uh, online stores, Jumai or Honda. And maybe you didn't buy it and you just forgot all about it. That same day or the next day or whenever, you go to Google to do a search or you go to a web page automatically. What you wanted to buy, the sites you visited will just come up. Because they have this algorithm now that is you know so crazy and intricate that 
they can track your lead and all that. Any click you make on any site that uh, might into uh, like a, a, a each store or something, they can bombard you on Google, bombard you on any website until they're tired because you just clicked their site. That is advert. Because they understand that if you don't put your product out there, nobody will come by and they'll be patronized. So, that is a skill. It's not um, my focus today, but that's a skill. A woman that is, you have got the age of marriage, but somehow, somehow, it's a safe guys are no longer, you know, asking, talking, you know, getting interested. There's a skill you must develop. That skill, Ruth mastered it. Now, Ruth has been married. It's not like she was a single woman. She was just a widow. And yet, she got married ahead of a lot of single ladies. So don't tell me that you're old, that's why. No, you're not old. I mean, um, Ruth, Ruth, my um, pet wasn't that young. That's one strike. So the second strike against Ruth was that she was previously married. The third strike against Ruth is that she wasn't an Israeli. Now, if you understand, that point alone, you know that it's going to be extremely difficult because one of the laws is that the Jews, the, the, the Israelites, don't marry outside the Commonwealth of Israel. Yes, she had these three strikes against her, and yes, she got one of the richest guys in the community. There's a skill to that. Make a list of your dream man. Like I usually say, when you are 15, your list might even take a lot of pages of your notepad. As you get into 2021, 20, you take off a couple of pages. As you're hitting 25, 26, 28, 29, and you know you're married, you take off a lot of pages. Maybe at 30, you only have one page with filled with the characters and attributes and you know qualifications of the kind of man you want to marry. As you're getting to 33, 35, you don't the list doesn't exist again. You just have the list in your head. You can just count it in one hand. You say, uh, maybe be born again. Of course, we all know that born again. It's okay, what has, um, what is born again, no? Uh, you can just, you can just, what is, you know, what is born again? I think, so, that list from where you are eating has been shrunk to one or two things. And like, don't you want it to be that tall, tall, that handsome, wealthy, this, blast, picture, blah, 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 blah. blah. It's, uh, all those words, those are not really matter. Born again, <laughs> I understand that, but make a list. The Bible says that God will grant us the desires of our hearts. So, if you just want a man that is just born again, you're trying, you're settling for less. God, of course, will grant your heart. And just give a man that's born again, and when you're not getting married, you discover that you actually wanted more from your husband, which you easily would have created. This is all about creation. God created us just to be like Him. The Bible says in Genesis 1, verse 26, that we are made in the image of God. And in his likeness, image, we look like him. But likeness is very critical. Likeness talks about being like God, acting, functioning like God. That is likeness. Functioning like God. Very critical. So if we are meant to function like God, we need to ask ourselves, how does God function? And when you look at Genesis chapter 1 and Jacob 2, you see that God is a creator. You know, all the creation in Genesis chapter 1, outside creation of space and things in space, all the creation in Genesis chapter 1, touching planet Earth, we are all created with God's imagination. All of them. From the vegetation, the trees, the, all that. All with his imagination. The animals. All with his imagination. Including man. When man was created in Genesis chapter 1, man was not on Earth. Man was in heaven, probably. In chapter 2, man was created on earth. When God created the vegetation in chapter 1, they existed after the earth. Because when you read Genesis chapter 2 from verse 5, the Bible says that there was no plant, shrub, grass, whatever on earth. Do you know why? It's because the Lord God had not caused it to rain. After that, it said because there was no man to till the ground. And yet, when you read chapter 1, you see that God created all those things. How come, if you created in chapter 1, they are still non-existent in chapter 2? Because in chapter 1, he created in his mind. He had the blueprint. Just like an architect can see a house without a house standing on the, on the land, but he can see it. He puts what he can see on paper so that the contractor takes that paper that he calls the blueprint of the plan 
to sight convert the architect's expectation, imagination into a physical structure. That is what happened in Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2. In chapter 2, God the Son came down on earth, molded man, and put the spirit of man that was created in chapter 1 into the mud. And the Holy Ghost gave mud life. Holy Ghost turned mud into blood vessels, capillaries, eyeballs, teeth, fingers, and all that. But they were first created in God's mind. But it was so real in his mind that the Bible said that he saw it and it was good. He saw it and it was good. What am I talking about? Talking about is one of the ways to transmit pictures into our mind is through words and through what we see. I'll say it again. You transmit pictures into your mind through words and through your eyes. Very important. Because when you look at Genesis chapter 1, how God transmitted those pictures into his mind. Well, the Bible says, And God said, Let there be light. God first said words. Those words were transmitted into pictures. The Bible says that, And God saw it, and it was good. Let me give you a vivid example. So now you're listening to me now. I'm going to just tell, try to describe something. And um, let's see what happened. So growing up when I was in secondary school, I love pets. And I had this dog. I love the dog. The dog was brown, blackish, with a long with that snout. I know they call the pigs on the snout, but you know what I mean. You know, and all that. Tall and big, um, a bit tall and big. And I love the dog. Brown and black and very, 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 very and big. You know, as I'm talking now, you're, you know what you're doing? You're trying to imagine the dog. You're wondering, what species of dog is he talking about? Some of you might, 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 have, might have offered a guess. But words paint pictures. I can go ahead and start describing him now, how his tail looked or how his tail, how the kind of tail he has. And you cannot actually guess right by just words. The dog I'm trying to describe, maybe I didn't even do a good job describing it anyway, but the dog I'm trying to describe is an Alsatian or a German Shepherd. I used to have a German Shepherd. And guess what? His name was Lynx. His name was Lynx. Beautiful dog. But you know what? I can still remember the dog. Now I've just talked about him. His picture came back in my mind. Why words paint pictures. So first we're talking about words, but I'm telling us to make a list. Yeah. When you make a list of the kind of man you have, paste it somewhere you can see it every day. And whenever you see it, read it out. Read every character, attribute, qualification out. Because as you read it, you hear it with your ears, you visualize it. Very important. It is the only principle you get today. I mean, this principle works magic, especially for those that have been waiting and waiting for their life partner. It works magic. Write it any day you see it. For ladies, I only tell them where you make up. I know a lot of ladies now don't have dressing dressing table. But if you have a dressing table on your dressing mirror, put the list there. Or put it on your headboard, on your bed. As you lie down to sleep, let it be the last thing you do after you've prayed and all that. Just recite it. So oh, my guy is going to be tall, it's going to be dark, it's going to have side bonds, or a goatee like me. It's going to be cold, it's going to be nice, it's going to treat me like a queen. It's going to be, of course, it's going to be well spoken. It's going to be this. Just say it. As you're saying it, you are visualizing it. Yeah, you, 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 get, you get to the point that you won't sleep saying it. You see the man in your dreams. No problem, it's good. We are creating it. That is how we create. That is one of the things God puts in every man. That is what the Bible says in Ephesians 3, verse 20, 20 that unto him was able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all we can ask or imagine, according to the power at work within us. That is that power I'm trying to get you to start using. There's a power at work within you that you don't utilize. It's called your expectation. It's called hope. It's called imagination. I don't know whether I, I should go further in this, but let me just show you one scripture. Because with this you can create, and even guys, with this you create all the money 
you ever wanted because a lot of guys give excuses that it is money that is holding them from getting married now i'm giving you the expo i'm giving you the expo okay i'm going to just show you this um romans chapter 8 verse 24 each on facebook i'm also streaming live on youtube we are saved by hope but hope that is saved is not hope for what a man seeth, why does he yet hope for it what's trying to explain from that verse 24 you understand that hope only from romans 8 verse 24 from that verse 24 you understand that hope is on sin you know they've taught us taught us hope in church but the kind of hope they focused on is what i call the blessed hope which is that one day we'll go to heaven that is hope that is the blessed hope but there's another hope which Paul talked about in in First Corinthians chapter thirteen, as I was ending the the, the the talk on love, he said something three things that exist: so charity, which is love, hope, and faith. So out of these three, the, the greatest is love. The hope he mentioned there is not the blessed hope; it's this hope I'm talking to you about. He said, "For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is no hope. For what a man can see physically, why then does he hope for it?" Now, taking a key from this scripture, we'll go to a popular scripture that you all know about, which is Hebrews 11 verse 1. What does the Bible say in Hebrews 11 verse 1? The Bible says in Hebrews 11 verse 1 that for that now faith is the substance of things hoped for. Are you seeing it? Are you seeing the relationship between faith and hope now? I would say that faith is the substance of things hoped for. And the evidence of things not seen. So, what am I trying to say? If you have faith that your spouse, that your life partner is going to find you, and you don't have hope, your faith will not work. I'll say that again. If you have faith that your life partner will find you, that your life partner, your life partner will find you this year, 2017, you have so much faith. But there is no hope your faith will not work because the bible made it clear in hebrews 11 verse 1 that what that now faith is the tangibility the matter matter is everything that has that has weight and occupies space is the tangibility the matter the substance of everything hoped for once you remove hope faith doesn't work so it is hope that I'm trying to teach you. When I give you that principle, make a list. Make a list. So what am I talking about? When you make that list, start calling it forth. Let me show you another scripture. Okay, see Romans chapter 4. Verse 16 says, Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace, to the end that the promise might be sure to all the seed. Not to that only which is of faith, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of all. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed. Even God, I like the scripture, it says even God, meaning like God, who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were. This scripture is a scripture I call God's modus operandi, which means how God functions, how God works. He said, even God, meaning this is how God functions. And he now told us how. How does God function? God calls those things that be not as though they were. God calls those things that be not as though they were. That is how God functions. So, if we are made just like God, we should be able to function the way God functions. We should be able to call those things that be not as though they were. So when you make that list, keep calling it. Let me give you an example. Alright, so I was talking about my pet. So what if one of those days when I had the pet, when I had links, and he was outside playing and I wanted to feed him. So I get his food, put him in his bowl in the kitchen. And I stand there and I try to use telepathy to come in to come and eat. Will he ever come out come from playing outside 
into the kitchen to eat? No. What do I want at that moment? I've got Lynx's food in a plate and I want Lynx to come and eat the natural thing, the, the normal thing that should be done is that I have food but I don't have Lynx and I want Lynx. The natural thing I'll do is that I'll shout, Lynx, Lynx, where are you, Lynx, Lynx? I will call him. Then of course, he will hear his name he will come running because he knows it's, 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 it's food. When I talk about the things I don't have, as if I have them, it is not arrogant. So people say, no, that is a lie. How can you be saying you have this, you have that, when you don't have it? You are sick. Say you are sick. But the Bible says, let the sick say, let the poor say they are rich. Let the weak say they are strong. But it is a lie. I am weak. I am weak. Say that you are weak. Tell the truth. Be realistic. Don't tell a lie. But that is not how God functions. God calls what be not as if it is. Yes, I have headache. Yes, I have fever. Yes, I'm weak. But I don't want to be weak. So I don't call weakness further. I call my preferred future. Now, my preferred future is health. So what do I need to do? I need to call health. So do I feel sick? Do I feel feverish? Do I'm very weak? I don't go saying and emphasizing the word. The more I say it, the power I walk within me creates it. That is how it functions because we are meant to function like God. Imagine if we are God and we appeared in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, where there was chaos everywhere. And we go like, oh God, chaos everywhere. See darkness everywhere. Oh no. Oh, see how the deep that is the sea has covered land. Oh no. Guess what? Nothing would have happened. That is why instead of throwing a pity party, throw a confession party. Throw a party where you are declaring your preferred future. That is why making a list is important. Because when you make the list, you call your preferred future forth. You call your dream man forth. You call your dream woman forth. You call those finances forth. Why would you not marry? Because you don't have money to pay rent. You don't have a house. They're still squatting. Call your house forth. I challenge you today. Call it forth. All the things that are stopping you from getting married, call it for. Not just for those that are never married. Even if you're married and you're struggling finance, financially, call the finances forth. Create it. You are like God. It is time to start acting like God. You cannot see a God act like, I don't know, you need to act like a God that you are a lion. You better roar like a lion. And don't whimper and scamper like one little dog somewhere. Call it forth. Call the finances forth. Hold hands with your spouse. Call it forth. You have the right to change every circumstance in your life. The problem, those circumstances are still persisting. Why the challenges have not yet gone is because you allowed them. Because you've not done anything about it. And since you've not done anything about it, that and those circumstances, those challenges will remain until you rule in the midst of your enemies. You are the king. You are the controller general. Start controlling things. Be the last man. Be the travel, traffic warden. Say halt to challenges. Stay, say halt to poverty. Say halt to sickness and diseases. Command them out of your life. And call for that dream man. Call for that dream woman. Call for the finances you need. Speak into the atmosphere and reorder your life. Enough is enough. It is time to change. The Bible says that where the word of the king is, there is power. Use your power that, that works within you. Speak your expectations to pass. The Bible says you shall say and say and say and not doubt in your heart. Then you will have what you say. So that in Matthew 11 verse 22. You shall have them what you say. Call them forth. Call it forth. Call it forth. So be like God. Start calling those things forth. Start calling those things forth. So that is why making the list is important. That is why it's Part of it. Time will fail me to go ahead. I really want to make this short because tomorrow is work and we need to go to work. But just one last scripture where this was totally played out by a man that is not born again. A man that did not have the Holy Ghost on his inside. A man that, <laughs> that never spoke in tongues for one day. Put this into operation and it worked for him. The spotted, the speckled, the brown, all that would be yours. But you know what he did? 
he quietly took all the ring strength they spotted the, of the she goats like a speckled spotted and everyone that had some white in it and all the brown into the hands of his son to give them to his son and told them to take this three days journey between the kids of Laban and Jacob three days so what happened is that Jacob now had the rest of Laban's flock what is the rest now pure whites and pure blacks we are left for him but remember it's higher we are supposed to be the browns the spotted the ring strict and all that but they have taken all of those animals that had those kind of design on their, on their skin and their fall out but Jacob being a covenant man have obviously learnt God's modus operandi which we just read in Romans chapter 4 well we, I didn't finish reading that but you know it's talking about Abraham meaning that Abraham finally got this revelation of how God functions do you know how God thought it to him do you know how God you know how God taught it to him God made a promise to him that he was going to have a son but at times his faith will fail so during the day God said no problem look at the sun said because you cannot count the sand on the ground remember they're living in the desert and sand is, in, uh, is, in excess, is excessively abundant in the desert so see look at the sun so will your offspring be your descendants be what was God doing? The same thing I talked to you about. He was painting a picture for him. That's why I said, make the list. Put it somewhere you can see it. So during the day, when Abraham sees the sun, he bends down, picks them up, runs through them. He cannot count them grain by grain. Then he looks to his left, north, south, east, and west. He's everywhere. He's just covered with sand. He's like, wow. So I'm going to have children in multitudes. When he sees the, the, the sun, the picture of his preferred future is painted on his inside. The power that is at work within him creates it in his imagination, thus giving him expectation that his faith acts on. Wow. But guess what? That is during the day. When night falls, you can't really see the sun because there's no sun anymore. You know what God also did to him? God came to him and said, no problem. I have made that promise to you again. He made the promise to him again. And you know what he told him this time around? He said, hey, look up. So look at the sky and look at all the stars and constellations. See, so you can count them. Say, so as many as much as they are, so will your offspring be. What was God doing? God was painting the picture of his preferred future, giving him a visual point of contact. That through visualizing those things, he creates the picture on his inside. When his faith acts on that expectation, the result is God immediately. And of course, the Bible says something about Abraham. I know him because he's going to command his children after me. That tells me something. He taught this to Isaac. Oh yeah, he taught this to Isaac. When Eliezer of Damascus went to go and get him a wife, Rebecca, and you know what happened there? It was as if she might come, she might not come, and all that. But then they saw the wealth of a man, she agreed to come. But something struck me. The Bible said that when Rebecca arrived to Canaan, that Isaac was in the field meditating, meditating, meditating. The Bible didn't say what he was meditating about, but I, I, I can, I can, I can profile a guess. He was possibly meditating, creating the wife, ensuring that the woman who agreed to come. I'm not shocked that Jacob also knew God's modus operandi, calling those things that be not as though they were with this verse. You know what he did? He went to the back of a tree, killed it, and made striped designs on it. The Bible says that he put, he set it, and he set the rods which he had peeled before the flocks in the gutters, in the watering trough, when the flock came to drink, that they should conceive, that they should conceive, that they should conceive when they come, when they came to drink. Now he put this picture in the water, and we know the New Testament the picture of water usually is of, of the word of God is usually water. The Bible says that we should be washed with water by the word. We should be water by the word. 
that is Ephesians chapter 5 that Jesus washes us with water his church is bright with the water by the word so he put this picture in the world what does that tell me you need to go back to God's word pick out the promises of God regarding your future pick out the promises of God regarding 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 your marriage your finances your career whatever it is and start meditating on it so you can conceive when you sit on the world on finances if it's a guy you need you need to change your levels when it comes to finances get out of the scripture on finances sit on them sit on them till you conceive when you conceive nobody knows on the outside like when a woman takes in nobody knows even she she doesn't know when she starts suspecting that she has conceived is when she's late when the monthly thing comes, the period when it's supposed to come, comes and passes and she does not see it, she will start now like, wow, something is going on. Usually when you focus on the word of God, when the revelation seeps in, you might not even know about it. But guess what? Even if that woman wants to hide it, some, you know, some women, maybe because of problems with childbirth, usually hide that they're pregnant. They keep it under the tabs until, you know, they've given birth. Which is a very wise thing to do, but guess what? You can hide it long. You know, what I mean, like, it's a matter of time. You can you cannot hide it beyond a couple of weeks and a couple of months but because it gets to a point, the conception will show because your tummy will start swelling. Once you conceive, it's just a matter of time. But what is so intriguing about this verse is that this thing worked on animals, animals. So as they come to come, like when they come to drink, they should conceive when they come to drink. Now, verse 10 now says, and the flocks conceived. Two conceptions. Two conceptions. The first conceive is in verse 38. The second conceive is in verse 39. Those are the two things that happened in Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2. The first conception is your expectation. The one in 39 is the physical act. The one in 38 is expectation, is hope. The one in verse 38 is expectation, is hope. But the one in verse 39 is the physical act. We need to learn to separate these two things. They are not the same. The same way when God said, let there be the vegetation, the animals, and all that in chapter 1 of Genesis, it was not the physical animals. They were not created then. The vegetations, they were not created then. They were created in chapter 2. Before man was created in chapter 7 of, of verse 7 of chapter, chapter 2, God physically commanded the ground to now bring forth the vegetation. Before God created the animals in chapter 2, it was when God said that it was not good for man to be alone. And God said, okay, Adam, go name the animals. For adventure, you will find a suitable helpmate. But before God could do that, there was no animal. Do you know what the Bible says? And God said he commanded, and God made, God made out of the ground these animals. He molded them. He barred them. But when you read chapter 1, the Bible says that he saw that it was good. So those were two different creations. First was the one that he spoke and saw with his mind, with his imagination, and that it was good. The second one was a physical act. The same thing in this Genesis chapter 30. Verse 38 was the animals believing they could see that they were going to conceive those patterns, those patterns that were put in the watering trough. But chapter 30, verse 39 was the physical act. I hope that is clear. So the Bible says that the flocks conceived before the rods and brought forth his wages, which were the ring streaked, the speckled, and the spotted. I will know what happened. Jacob separated them. That's what I want to show you. The next chapter, chapter 31. And it came to pass. At the time that the cattle conceived. This is now the second conception. That is when the cattle are mating. Remember what, what cattle is mating. Pure whites, pure blacks. The ones that were definitely not his hire or his wage. And we know in genetic science that pure whites and pure blacks is a, the chance that they will never, never give birth to spotted people and all those things listed in his wages is like 99.9%, which one plus minus 0.1% error margin. I mean, it's nearly impossible, that's what I'm trying to say. But see what he did. As they were meeting physically, he said, I lifted up my eyes and saw where in a dream, it must not really be the dream as we know it today, but he tried to tell us how he used his hope, how he used his expectations. The same way God taught Abraham to use the stars, to use the sand, 
as he looks at them, he could see his descendants, multitudes upon multitudes, generation upon generation of Jews coming out from his loins. It's the same thing Jacob did here. This is how God operates. The secret of how God operates, which these men, these patriarchs used, they were all revealed to us in that place in Romans, I read for you chapter 4. He said, And I saw in a dream, and behold, the rams which leaped upon the cattle were ring streaked, speckled, and greased, and greased, and greasy. I'm going to rest my case here. We'll continue it from here. Remember, we thought that make a list. So make that list. Why the list is supposed to be your point of contact. The list is supposed to be what you look at that will help you create your preferred future. You want a man. Go on the internet, get pictures of some fine, fine young men. Use them as your screensaver. Put them on your phone. Be looking at them. Guys, I believe in God for money, for finances. Get the house you want, get the dream car, get the kind of business you want. Use them as a screensaver. Start believing God for it. Start brooding over it. Let it be the last thing you see before you go to bed. Let it be one of the first things you see when you wake up in the morning. Make the list. Read it out to yourself. As you read it, you visualize it. As you say it, you create it because your words have creative power. The Bible says the words I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Make a list. I know what I'm talking about. Make a list. All those delayed miracles will end in the mighty name of Jesus. I join my faith with yours and I call forth every single thing you believe God for. I command it now to find you. Whatever your heart desires, let it find you. I command the four winds of the earth to go, the north, the south, and the west wind, and bring to you your heart desire. I command the east wind to go destroy everything that is not your heart desire. Whatever the enemy has planned, let the east wind, the destroying wind, go right now and totally destroy it. I command favor as you step into a new week starting today. Favor from the Lord cloaks you. Doors open for you. Your phone will ring and an an unexpected call will come true. You must be favored this week. In the name of Jesus.